information with census. Uh, first of all, um, thank you to all of you who have already responded to uh, census. And for those of you who haven't respond, responded, please, uh, uh, you know, spend a few minutes online or a few minutes on the phone to uh, do the, uh, to uh, make your response. Um, it only takes a few minutes, but it's gonna have a big impact for the next 10 years for, uh, for our future and for our community future as well. So uh, please keep that in mind. Um, okay, here's the updated um, information. Uh, census has been uh, extended uh, all the way from July 31st. That was the original uh, ending, ending date, but now it uh, has a new ending date, uh, which is October 31st. For all of you who hasn't responded, you have up until October 31st, 2020 to respond. Uh, so, uh, but we encourage you to go ahead and, and uh, respond as soon as possible because uh, the sooner we get everybody to, to respond, uh, the less we have to send out uh, people to your neighborhood, to your door and asking you to uh, respond uh, in person. Um, again, I just wanna remind everybody, it only takes a few minutes. You can do it online, you can do it on the phone. Um, there's only nine questions for the first person and then uh, seven questions for uh, the, uh, the second person in, in your family. So uh, it wouldn't take that long at all for you to, to respond to that. Uh, second of all, I just wanna update on the, uh, the number of people that uh, have responded uh, so far. Um, nationwide, we are at 53.4% uh, on the response rates. In Texas, we are at 48.9%. In Harris County, we are at 48.4%, uh, which is good, but uh, I think we can do so much better. Um, and um, also that uh, you can either respond online, you can respond on the phone, or you can fill out the forms and mail it in. Um, this will, um, beginning of June, if we haven't received your response, we will send out uh, the uh, uh, response team to uh, help you fill out the forms. Uh, if you have any questions, any concerns, you can get online to uh, at 2020census.gov. Um, also, by the way, we are still hiring right now. So if you uh, need a job or if you know anybody uh, uh, want to get a part-time job, they can get on the website and put it put in applications. Um, the pay is between 20 to $25 an hour. Um, you get paid weekly. You will get paid while you're on training and you can uh, work full-time, part-time. Uh, you can choose your own hours to work. It's flexible and um, you will get all the benefits uh, while you're working full-time with us as well. Okay, so thank you everybody. That's all I have. Uh, if you have any question, I'm, I'm still going to be here um, to answer your question. Thank you. Uh, Johnny, can you can you address um, uh, how much it's worth to, to Harris County for each person to respond? The, the number that I heard was $1,500 per year times ten. Yes, ma'am. That is uh, approximately the amount that I I, um, I was informed. It's between fifteen thousand to seventeen thousand thousand dollars per person per year. So uh, you know, imagine if we get everybody to participate. That 
that's going to be a lot of money for our community. Uh, it's going to go toward our new school. It's going to go toward Medicaid, Medicare, uh, food stand, SNAP food, housing, uh, pretty much, uh, and so much more uh, for our community, uh, for highway constructions, uh, for um, new hospitals, uh, and for those uh, that need help right now, especially during this time, this is what this is exactly why you need to uh, to uh, respond to census because this this will help you now and it will go in the future as well. Anybody have any questions for Johnny? Do you have any questions for Johnny? Well, thank you. I, I'm still going to be here. So uh, if you have any question, I'll, I will uh, try to um, answer your question. Thank you, Johnny. I appreciate it. <clears throat> Sherelle, we're, we're a little ahead of schedule. Are you are you ready? Yes, I am. Can everyone hear me? Uh, faintly. Faintly. OK, give me one second. Is this better? Yes. Okay, perfect. Well, first, I just want to say on behalf of Council Member Thomas, um, we're very um, appreciative that you all allowed us the space to join this meeting today. Um, I see some of my colleagues, Torrance, as well as Long, um, are both in attendance. So just know that we are continuously working on behalf of you every single day. And if there's ever anything that you need, feel free to reach out to me, Council Member Thomas, or any of our fellow uh, colleagues. So with that, I'll dive deep into, I'll just go ahead and dive right into my update. So just a high level update of COVID-19. We all know that Governor Abbott recently, um, as of yesterday, he sent out some new information. And so um, starting Friday, owners of restaurants, malls, movie theaters, and other retail in our state um, have been cleared to go back to business, um, but they have to have a limit customer occupancy of just 25% maximum. And this is the rate that some of them have already been adhering to. Um, so it'll just be an expansion and a continuation of that. Do know that there are some businesses who are going to, restaurants who are going to continue to operate as drive-through only. And so people are, owners of these uh, businesses are making decisions at their discretion, um, despite <laughs> what has been told. Um, and if we have no outbreaks that are detected during this time, then the state will move to phase two, which will allow 50% capacity, and they're estimating that will occur on May 18th. But as of now, schools will remain closed. Summer camps for kids are out for now, but there are outdoor sports that are okay, like tennis, um, for just four people who are playing, and churches can also expand capacity, um, and sole proprietors can return to business. Um, so there's information about that. I just want to um, encourage everyone that as we begin to open back up, the mayor stated today that it's, well, the city of Houston urged us that it's critically important that we still practice social distancing and that we wear a face mask. So please adhere to the advice that is given to you. And speaking of masks, um, District F recently had a mask distribution at Crump Stadium and Piney Point Elementary. And we really appreciate everyone who came out to volunteer as we gave away 5,000 masks. Um, we are delivering a few remaining masks from the Piney Point site this week um, to those who could not pick, pick up one last weekend. We only have about 40 left. So if you want one, please get your request in now. You can email District F, D I S T R I C T F, at HoustonTX.gov to make a request. And we'll let you know if your request can be granted per the number of masks that we have left. Um, but also good news, we have confirmation that India House will be donating a thousand masks to us. So that will allow us to continue our efforts to make sure that not only residents of District F, but, you know, people who are in vulnerable populations are well taken care of. Does anybody have any questions around that? None that I see. Okay, so um, just an update about our budget. So just currently we are in budget workshop 
Salad Waste will present this Thursday. If you want to view our budget workshops, you can go and watch them on HTV. It's on Facebook, and you can just see what everyone is talking about. It's all the rave. But just know that across the city that we are anticipating furloughs, and we have temporary CDSF project freezes, although we're still accepting requests. And so that's kind of how we're operating with our CDSF funds and the projects that people want to see completed. So as far as CDSF is concerned, for fiscal year 2020, we have a current fund balance of approximately 112, 100 S projects where they include the employees. Chief, Chief, I think you're breaking up. I think yeah. Yeah. Sure rock replacement in Huntington Village. Hey, hey, Chief. Crown. Sherelle. Sherelle, start that part over again. You, you were breaking up. Yes, can you hear me? Oh, well, let's see. Are you okay now, Sherelle? Sherelle's on mute. Can everyone hear me? Yeah, I can hear you now. Yeah. Okay. What was the last thing you all heard? Sorry about that. Oh, repeat the information about CDSF. Sure. Um, so for fiscal year 2020, we have a current fund balance of approximately $112,000. Um, and that's inclusive of the estimated and improved projects. Some of those projects include Park Glen Speed Cushions, uh, a pavement repair on Clarewood, sidewalk replacement in Huntington Village, Brooksfield which the work was complete, Crown Colony West, um, Collins Elementary, Spark Park, um, and then the Shelford City CIP project update, which is not including that because it's CIP, but just an update about that project. Um, as a response to increasing traffic, when drivers uh, get back on the road, a two-phase signal has been implemented that will provide more green time on the left turn lane going westbound and southbound at West Park and West Houston Center Boulevard for drivers to clear the intersection. And then eastbound and northbound left turns will be restricted completely to minimize the impact to through traffic. This means that drivers headed eastbound and northbound will use the next signal to turn to their destinations. And as Ms. Barber already mentioned, the ACC is officially a go. Um, demolition has started, which we're all excited about. And we're really appreciative of everyone who signed up to receive the brick. We received over 90 requests when we first anticipated that we would get about 50. So yeah. thank you everyone who we almost reached double that. Um, and General Services has that reservation of bricks for us. And so we're going to work with them to determine when we can distribute the bricks and how we're going to do that. So just stay tuned for more information. Does anyone have questions about that? Nope. Okay, great. Um, so as you all may know, tomorrow we will have our April 29th council meeting. And I just wanted to just give you a brief highlight of um, projects that are items that will be considered that are related to District F. Um, and you can review this information on our website. And if you need any further information, you can call me or Long or Torrance and we can get it to you. Um, but item number 12, it's a recommendation from the Director of Houston Public Works for approval of final contract amount. Basically, um, it's about a waterline repairment in the Tangle Out area. And it's 1.1% over the original contract amount. So we just have to approve that. Item 16, that's with regards to the garbage and, re and recyclables 
um, that everyone has had a lot of questions about. And uh, we, today, we polled many community leaders for their feedback about the garbage fees and the recyclables, and the overwhelming majority are in support of this. Just if you aren't aware, so what this does it will establish a cart lease fee of 0.57, so 57 cents per container, or $1.14 per customer household served. That's $13.68 per year, per person, um, per can that you lease out. And this provides a proper maintenance and replacement levels for the city's container inventory. At the moment, we do not charge anything to replace containers, but we were able to speak to Mayor Turner this morning, the council member and I, um, and we also were able to hear from Director Hayes, and they let us know that this um, funding, not only does it provide uh, revenue for us, it also helps us to not have to furlough employees. And so it's really, um, I think that's where most of our support comes, is that we're able to charge a very minimal amount per year in comparison to some of our other large cities in the state. And then we can also save employees from being furloughed. And this is going to begin if begin July 1st, 2020. Item number 20 is about Hurricane Harvey small rental program lines. And the gist of this one is just, it's just a simple one is that we need uh, the program to increase affordable renting housing stock um, through infill development of new affordable small renting properties and more affordable renting housing in Houston. And this program is going to provide financial assistance through forgivable loans to nonprofit ent entities that serve low to moderate income markets. Item 22 is the CARES Act. Uh, it would create CARES Act 2020 funds, which will establish sources and uses of funds therein to aid in the economic relief pertaining to COVID-19. Item 23, and I'm just about done. Item 23, it's an ordinance, and it would approve and authorize uh, Mayor Turner to accept grants from various federal entities for public health crisis response. Um, it would declare the city's eligibility for such grants and authorize the mayor to expend grant funds as awarded and to apply and accept all, subse all subsequent awards, if any, pertaining to the grant. So in order for 23 to pass, the previous CARES Act must pass for it to be in tangent with each other. And then finally, item 35 is an ordinance approving the issuance of bonds and notes by Southwest Houston Redevelopment Order Authority, and that affects not only District F, but District J. Um, and the recommendation is that City Council adopt an ordinance approving the issuance of bonds and notes um, by the Southwest Houston Redevelopment Authority, which would increase debt authorization amount to the total aggregate principal amount not to exceed approximately $80 million outstanding at any one time. So outside of that, I just want to reiterate um, just some information about the census. Currently, of all the districts, District F has a response rate of 44.3%. Um, so we want to make sure that we're kind of in the middle lower part of the pack amongst the districts. So I really encourage everyone to go online and to encourage your neighbors and friends and families to take their census. You can go to mycensus2020.gov to take it online. And we're also gonna start outreach, outreach efforts this upcoming week to ensure that we are reaching out to people as much as possible. So you can expect a call from us and it's totally okay, just answer the phone. We're just gonna remind you to take your census. So with that, that, that concludes my updates. If anyone has any questions. Let's see. I see no questions. So, Miss Barbara, back to you. Uh, hi, everyone. It's long. Uh, I just got a text message from uh, Barbara that her computer restarted. So she'll be uh, back up and running in a couple of minutes. Uh, 
So uh, she's asked me to move the meeting along. And so our next presenter is Ms. Norma Atherton from the Houston Health Department. Uh, Ms. Atherton? Uh, yes, sir. Can you hear me? Yes. Can you? Okay, because okay, I'm fairly new to the technology as well. <laughs> And one of the things I see, I don't see my initials up there, so I'm not sure what I did wrong, but I'll have more opportunities to figure that out. Um, my name's Norma Atherton, and I work in the Houston Health Department in what's called public health preparedness. And essentially that is I'm a trainer that goes into different community groups to uh, train people for, usually it's hurricane preparedness. But in the past few years, it's dealt more with flooding. But, you know, train the vulnerable populations on how to prepare uh, and also how to more than just survive, but flourish, you know, after after a disaster. I had prepared to uh, talk about uh, Governor Abbott's report. And but since, um, you know, Ms. Duncan has covered some of that, what I will do is cover some of the areas you know, that she she didn't cover. And Mr. Long, are you the one that can bring up um, HoustonEmergency.org link? Yes, yes. I have it up. And what Mr. Long is going to bring up is for Harris County and for the city of Houston, we have a combined dashboard that shows all of the data and information dealing with the COVID-19 pandemic. And so uh, I want to make you familiar with, with this tool because it has so much information um, that, you know, you'll find interesting. And also I want to show you where to find uh, your super neighborhood information on here, too. The um, if you if you the link is HoustonEmergency.org slash COVID-19. Is, is everyone able to see the screenshot? I don't see anything from my end. No. Does anybody else? I don't it? see it. No. Yeah, I don't see it either. I don't, I don't okay. see it either. Yeah. No, no. bro. Uh, nope. How about now? Mm, not yet. Not, not yet. Nope. Just your initial. <laughs> Because uh, one of the one of the say on, on uh, the uh, the HoustonEmergency.org website, I say one of the things that you'll find interesting is there is a vulnerability map that includes all the COVID-19 cases separated by super neighborhood. Oh, there we go. There we go. Uh, okay. Oh, you got. It. Can we scroll down? A little bit. Keep going. Keep going. Okay. Keep go up. Just move up just a little bit. I want to show you two things before we move on. Okay. Right. Stop right here. Do you see the one that says COVID nineteen data hub toward the bottom? That one I just want to make you aware of. But it has um, the vulnerability map, which sh shows you can show you all the super neighborhoods and the COVID cases is going there and a lot of information. And it does take a little, a little, it's a little bit slow to load. And on the layer list, yeah, these purple, see it's actually showing the super neighborhood areas and then um, you're able to like drill down and get additional information. There's all the different information you can look at vulnerability groups, housing, health risk, all of that. So I just want to make you aware of it because it has a lot of information. OK, I don't want to spend too much time. And then, OK, go back to where we were. And under the data hub, um, the impact planning report provides important planning information that that'll be useful to you like what's going on in the different areas it's big <laughs> it's 
anyway, it breaks it down by the different areas and has a lot of, in, of information about each of those neighborhoods. Okay, I, uh, let's go out of that now. Go up a little bit. We're going to go to the, the dashboard. So Houston Harris County cases. We're going to click on Houston Harris County cases. And I just want to point out what you're seeing and then you can go take a look at your convenience. Um, it's still loading. This is the numbers for Harris County in Houston. It's different from the numbers that you hear on the news because I think they're including Fort Bend County. But the confirmed cases, COVID-19 cases, um, I think they changed this since yesterday. Um, usually under each one, there's there should be Harris County only, City of Houston only, and combined. So uh, those little arrows weren't there yesterday. <laughs> And this just breaks it down into the different uh, views they have of the information. Okay. And hang on. The box in the upper right that says combined age groups, it shows you which age groups are being the most affected. So my little toolbar is in the way. So it looked like 30 to 39 age group was uh, the most affected between, I think, Harris County and the city of Houston. Okay, then go back. And bottom right corner, combined sex is showing that uh, COVID-19 is affecting men and women almost equally. So the, both sexes are equally getting sick um, but the death rate is, you know, different. Uh, typically, the death rate is higher among males than females. Okay, you back out of that. And what, okay, and what, um, I just wanted to show you that, but, you know, it also drills down the numbers into race and ethnicity, but one of the things that that it shows on here is because when people were registering for the COVID-19 testing, apparently there was not a box that asked for race and ethnicity. And so it's it's actually below below this middle area right here. But about half of the cases did not ask for race or ethnicity, so we're not able to get as much information. There it is, combined race and ethnicity. The blue one means the uh, race or ethnicity was unknown. So that's unfortunate that in the beginning they were not requesting race or ethnicity. Okay, okay, we're gonna, I'm going to get out of that and just going to talk to you more about um, what Governor Abbott is doing. So if you want to close that one down. And I'm going to cover some of the things that Ms. Duncan uh, uh, didn't cover. Uh, I want to elaborate more on, on phase one and phase two. Under phase two, those services that are going to be opening on Friday, which will be opening at 25% capacity, we'll be able to expand to 50% capacity by May 18th if there is no change in hospital bed availability by then. Under uh, uh, Governor Abbott's uh, executive order, we must maintain 15% bed availability for COVID-19 patients. And so he's monitoring that or his task force is monitoring that. And also they'll be monitoring deaths counts. So that will is what will determine whether or not we can open up more businesses after May 18th. He's also hinted at that there's a possibility they'll be opening up possibly things like bars and spas uh, after May 18th. But we'll just have to see. Uh, that was a, more like a teaser. The um, the things that did not open 
and will not open until possibly phase two where the swimming pools, bars, gyms, cosmetology salons, massage establishments, interactive amusement venues such as bowling alleys and video arcades, tattoo and piercing stations and studios, and those will remain closed uh, depending on what happens um, during phase one. One of the things that I am uh, was happy to see in uh, the governor's plan is there going to be a lot of emphasis on nursing home and nursing facilities. So nursing homes, state supported living centers, assisted living facilities and long term care facilities must during this time still remain closed to visitors unless to provide critical assistance. However, what he's done, he's created a detailed plan with eight major recommendations that uh, will be used for all the health, uh, for all the nursing homes and living centers in order to uh, slow down and prevent the, prevent the COVID-19 infections that are occurring. Because right now, you know, the nursing homes and nursing facilities have among the highest uh, COVID-19 infection rates. And so what he's outlined is, and I'll just tell you essentially what it's about, is it's going to be important that COVID-19 cases are identified immediately in nursing homes, which means testing all staff and residents for COVID-19 and finding out, you know, who their contacts have been. And then with his program for statewide testing and contact tracing, it's really important that, you know, the mayor, I mean, excuse me, the, that um, the epidemiologists find out who has been in contact with that patient uh, that has tested positive for COVID-19 and get them isolated and into quarantine if they need it in order to slow and stop the further spread of COVID-19. Also, both state, county, and city level health departments are evaluating currently like 300 um, healthcare facilities resident facilities to see uh, if they need to improve their um, infection control. They are, they're looking at those that are having high, higher COVID-19 infections and going in to see what they can change and improve about the, um, the, you know, the methods that are being used in those hospitals. Uh, they'll be using things um, like testing the employees, testing their temperature, checking their temperature and asking for their, uh, if they've had a cough or any of these uh, symptoms for COVID-19 prior to coming to work each morning. They're going to stop um, uh, those, those workers that are trying to work at multiple places and just keep them at one location. Uh, and then they're going to uh, control those people who are bringing different services to the nursing homes so that they can minimize the spread of COVID-19. Um, also under, under his uh, executive order, he's allowed uh, all healthcare professionals, you know, before he was saying that, uh, I guess you say elective procedures were restricted, but now he's going to allow all health professionals essentially to work um, with their licensing agencies to work under the safe practices of a COVID-19 disaster. So that's loosening all the procedures that doctors can do in the health health uh, in the hospitals. Um, and as I mentioned on um, the uh, as a part of the requirement, hospitals have to keep 15 percent of its op occupancy available for COVID-19 patients. Um, and the other thing is he's ramping up testing. He's trying to get all of Texas to be able to do 3,000 tests per day with rapid turnaround because it's really important to identify who has the infections because there are people, possibly 25% of the people may be asymptomatic, not showing any uh, symptoms, but could be spreading the disease. So it's really important that we get people tested and using contact tracing, slow down the spread of disease because we want to know where we are on the curve to make sure that we're flattening the curve. So 
that's all I'm going to cover on um, the governor's report, and I'll just open it up for any questions. There are no questions in the chat box. Okay. Uh, I have a question. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Norma, we have a, a, a community pool, um, and ordinarily, uh, starting in the month of May, we would start doing pool passes so that uh, we usually open by Memorial Day. What What's your recommendation, or is it too soon to tell? I, I mean, I have no idea. Yeah. You're right. It's it's too soon to tell because, you know, he's just saying they're going to be closed through phase one. But phase two is May 18th, and he'll be looking at what the data has been showing as far as uh, the number of admissions to hospital, as well as, you know, number of deaths and uh, the rate of infections. So we don't know at this point, but we can cross our fingers and hope that, you know, we, we stay out of trouble. And it's like every, you know, it seems like everything changes from day to day, and week to week. So it we very likely could 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 you know reopen. We'll but just have there, to wait and see. There's there's no research or anything about transmission. Uh, Not that I've seen. You yeah. know, consider, yeah. Wow. Because I know, I know the polio epidemic was actually traced um, to fecal contamination in swimming pools. Wow. Wow. Okay. All righty. We have a question from Diane. She's asking, when will dentist offices be allowed to open? Based on what I am see seeing in this document, it looks like now. It does. And... Um, I sent Mr. Long a copy of the document from the from the governor. It's a 64 page document and it has all the instructions, uh, protocols for all the different types of businesses, gatherings and everything uh, that he's covering. I sent that uh, email. I, I forwarded it to a leaf life. Um, so if uh, if you're on the call and and aren't uh, on that mailing list, um, let me know and and uh, we can send you a copy of the uh, uh, list that, or the documentation that it, normally. It's a have. lot. It's a very yeah. a lot of information. Yeah. Because like on churches, it's actually recommending that people be six feet apart, that you skip every other row in in the in the uh, church, um, and there was no mention actually of wearing mask in the church. Wow. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so is there going to be a rush on haircuts? I mean, I look like a dog. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> Touching up roots and everything. <laughs> Long, show us your picture. No, of course, no, I haven't no. heard any men complain, but I'm sure their hair's getting long, too. <laughs> Nobody will turn their camera on. Nobody wants right. to they, they a haircut. <laughs> oh, my. <laughs> Okay, okay, well, that was, that was some good information, Nora. Appreciate it. Um, okay. Thank you so much. I'll go ahead and mute then. Thank you. Uh -huh. Okay, we're, we're moving along rapidly. If you have some questions, uh, feel free to, to, to jump in. Um, Mr. Chambers, are, are, you, are you there? Yes, ma'am. I'm somewhere. I'm here. <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> All right. Thank you. And, mm -hmm. Uh, for those that, that uh, haven't had the pleasure of meeting, I'm H.D. Chambers. I'm superintendent of schools for ALEAF ISD, and um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cover a couple of, of uh, overarching issues with public education because uh, it's all related to all of us. I mean, I'll give you some ALEAF information, but just know regardless of where you live or if you have kids or grandkids or wherever, whatever school system they're in, this is going to, for the most part, apply to to public ed across across the state. Um, one thing I want everyone to be aware of is that we are, uh, as I make decisions and as the school board uh, helps make decisions on a variety of issues, uh, we're taking our lead for the most part uh, from our local and state leaders. Uh, obviously, when the governor makes his declarations, there are some that, that we have no choice but to follow. But in, in the cases in which there's conflict between the state 
and uh, the county or the city, uh, we're managing those to, to do what we think is in the best interest of our staff and our students. So as it relates to decision making, we're using guidance from the, from both of those um, uh, both of those entities. Uh, I will tell you that that as you know, schools have been closed for the rest of the quote unquote school year. Uh, they're not closed in the sense that we're not doing anything. They're just the facilities, the brick and mortar are closed. So we're, we we kind of use the term suspension of normal operations. Uh, our school year is over May 21st. We're continuing with the calendar as though we were in school. So nothing is changing. We're not we're not ending the year early. We're not doing anything differently. Um, um, Thursday, May 21st was the last day of school for our kids, and uh, and we will follow that that schedule as as we are right now. Uh, the two big issues that are going on and have been going on since day one of this was how school districts across the state literally within and I'm not exaggerating, probably within four or five days, flipped their entire instructional platform from a classroom based uh, traditional classroom to either a technology based or a paper pencil packet based, depending on the child's ability to have access to the Internet or the devices to even access the Internet. And um, I, I, if you've got if you've got school age children, uh, you know what I'm talking about because you've been dealing with this for the last six or seven weeks as a parent. Uh, but the but the the actual uh, the way in which the, the the school systems have flipped how we teach kids has been absolutely um, amazing, to say the least. So just to give you a little few data points in ALEAF, we've got roughly 47,000 students, and roughly we were able to. Uh, communicate with almost 85% of our students somehow, meaning we made contact with them somehow. Uh, every day that number increases slightly, but so we're at a point where somewhere in the neighborhood of 10% of our students we're not, we've yet to make contact with. The state average, as we understand it right now, is around 15% that have that, that, that of the students who have not been com communicated with. So, so we're, we're kind of right there in the ballpark. Um, of the 85%, here's the big issue that the, that everyone is dealing with. Of the 85%, roughly 68 to 70% actually have access to the internet. And so that means almost 30% do not. And this is a citywide issue. It's a county issue. It's a statewide issue. And uh, just so you know, we, uh, I have, I'm on this little small group that includes members out of the mayor's office and the county judge's office as we begin looking for short term solutions to this and long term solutions to this. But um, um, it's going to take a, it's going to require leadership. It's going to require partnerships with with all of our telecommunication vendors and companies, many of which are willing to participate and have been participating. Uh, but I'm not as I'm not as concerned about right now as I am going forward, uh, because whether we have another round of this this virus in the fall, like it's being predicted, uh, or whether it kind of comes and goes over a period of time until a vaccine is out there, school systems are going to have to more and more rely on 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 um, on the internet and connectivity for families at home uh, to continue the education of kids. So uh, this is not just a short-term COVID-19 issue. This is a long-term issue that uh, that I'm committed to working with whoever it takes to to help. Uh, our children of our most, our most, um, our most vulnerable kids, our most needy children are the ones who aren't able to access uh, the types of quality education being offered right now online. And um, I would encourage you if, if if you're just curious about what a online education looks like, uh, go to Aleaf ISD's website, and on the on the web page there's a there's a link called Aleaf Learns, A L I E F Learns, L E A R N S. And if you click on that, you can just kind of navigate through all of the information we've provided families and parents and kids from pre-Kers and kindergartners all the way up to our high school kids. But uh, uh, it's a it's a daunting task. And I guess uh, what I would say about the education that's going on right now across the state of Texas is in spite of the Herculean efforts that 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 have been put in place to help um, parents and children in spite of all that work, in spite of all that information, I really believe that that um, we're going to have to come back and, and address the issues of 
of uh, of the learning gaps that are being exacerbated right now. And it wouldn't it's not going to surprise you that uh, our most vulnerable students are our, our, our kids who are socially economically deprived, our kids who is who are who are uh, limited in their English proficiency. Those are the kids that are struggling and and they're struggling because in large part uh, because of this digital divide. So if, if, if anything I say, if you listen to anything I say as terms of a, a call to arms or a call to action as we move forward, it's going to be how do we address the digital divide? And again, this is not an A-leaf problem. This is a this is a, a, a an issue across the across the uh, across the region and across the state. It just exacerbates itself in in poor in poor communities. Um, <clears throat> so with with this, that means we're going to have to restructure how we educate kids moving into the summer and into the fall. And we we know is we don't know any more than you know. We don't know what's going to happen in the next couple of weeks. We don't know what's going to happen uh, as it relates to the opening of schools, uh, but we do know this. Whenever we do open and however we open, uh, we're going to have to go back and reteach what what we've what we've lost during this nine week period. So to put it in perspective, we lost an entire grading period, a leaf grades on four nine week uh, sections. We lost the entire fourth nine weeks. And uh, and I'm not that's not to say that there isn't learning taking place right now with all that's going on. There is. But I can't be confident as a superintendent. I can't be confident in, in knowing that um, that every one of my students have had that same opportunity. So we're going to have to we're going to have to assess, and we're putting together assessments. We're going to have to work. Uh, we're going to have to work to identify what children uh, have the larger gaps, and we're going to do that both uh, this spring, this summer, and early next fall. Uh, but those are those are that's a that's a huge issue right now. Uh, we cannot, I cannot just make, act like nothing happened this nine weeks and send a third grader to fourth grade next school year knowing that that there's gaps that have been created because that gap will stay in existence for the rest of their life or at least the rest of their public school life. And uh, so that's a huge issue, not just in A-LEAF, that's a huge issue in all school systems. Um, I feel really sorry for our seniors uh, across the country. Uh, but they're they understand it. I have a senior a student advisory group that I talked to and they they they're disappointed too. But we are working on uh, we have three dates, two in July and one in August as as fallback dates. If we're able if we're ever, if we're going to be able to come together and and have some type of traditional commencement exercise. We're also doing a, com a virtual graduation that's being prepared as we speak. And so we're we're doing everything that we can possibly do. <clears throat> excuse me to make to make this uh, this time of the year as special as possible fully knowing we're not we're not going to we're not going to be able to, to 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 replicate what these kids would have went through had they gone through a normal senior year so um, on the on the academic side a lot of hard work a lot of good things put in place a lot of things we're going to we're going to continue even beyond and on the other side of the virus things we learned about ourselves just like other industries have that uh, that we're going to that we're going to replicate and continue doing. Uh, but the one thing we can't replicate is we can't replicate um, teaching and instruction without without me knowing uh, that every one of my kids are being are having access to a, a quality education, whether it's online or with paper pencil. Um, so the that that's the academic side, just a few other things and I'll be quite um, uh, we have served, uh, on average, roughly 4,000 meals a day uh, to students, both breakfast and lunch. Um, we will continue that for the foreseeable future. We'll, we'll continue it into the summer. Um, our nutrition department, our nutrition staff has been nothing short of, of amazing. Uh, these these men and women are, uh, I can't tell you, uh, they're not the highest paid people in the district. Uh, many of them work part time. Uh, but when I tell you their commitment to making sure kids and families get food and um, and that and it's prof and provided in a timely fashion, I am uh, I can't tell you how great it is. I know our school board's proud of them. Uh, so if you know someone that works in the nutrition department, uh, just tell them thanks. Uh, there are many kids who, are, who would not be eating if it weren't for them showing up every morning from nine o'clock to roughly noon. Uh, passing out breakfast and lunch to to to, to families. So, 
Uh, and I know the YMCA, I know the Houston Food Bank, I know there's local churches that are using our facilities, our parking lots, et cetera, to do the same thing. And uh, wherever we can help as a school district, whether it's letting you use our, our, our grounds or us chipping in and, and lending a hand, we, we're gonna do that. Um, a lot of families are struggling as, as, you, as you were well aware. Um, real quickly on money, on the budget, um, the state of Texas has told us, and I'm a part of a small group that speaks to the governor and his staff and our leaders, uh, they are going to continue funding public education uh, based on the same formulas that they were if we were in school. The only caveat to that is we have to demonstrate to the state that we're providing an education to the best of our ability. And we've got plenty of evidence of that. Matter of fact, we're leading the state in several several issues as it relates to, to um, you know, to, to receiving state money, to re from receiving taxpayer money, your taxpayer dollars, as well as state uh, dollars. Um, but right now we're gonna continue uh, being funded uh, at the levels in which we were anticipating. That includes building a budget for, not, for next school year. Now, what next school year is gonna look like, I'm not sure, and we'll talk about that in one second, but just be, be aware that our budget as of right now, uh, is expected to remain the same. Uh, our tax rate is expected to stay the same. As a matter of fact, um, we're going to be evaluating the tax rate with the board over the next several months. And depending on what happens with with values, there may be a, a decrease in the tax on the debt service side. Uh, but just be aware that we're we're working diligently to to manage the taxpayer dollars and put us in a position that if we do have to experience cuts in the future. Uh, we will we will be prepared to absorb those without any without with as less at least amount of damage as possible. Uh, but right now we're moving full forward. The board approved contracts last Tuesday night during their board meeting, and we are uh, we're holding teachers and staff members and the superintendent accountable for for earning their paychecks through this time period. Um, I've been on several several of these meetings with the the Greater Houston Partnership and. Uh, the Texas Business League, and I, I did a little presentation for the Texas Business Council last week. And the one thing that the business community told me is that they're they're having to try to figure out how to hold their employees accountable while working from home, meaning making sure they're working and making sure that they're 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 doing the same thing they would have done had they been in an office with somebody over you know looking over their shoulder. And I told them, I said, in the school system, we've had that in place for years. That that is that is nothing new, but but. Uh, the reason I'm bringing it up is because many of you are taxpayers. You, you, uh, you're, you're, well, you're all taxpayers, but many of you pay your taxes through your property taxes through our school district, and uh, the board and myself are doing everything we we can to ensure that those tax dollars are still being used wisely, and and being and being spent wisely. Um, now, the future of school finance. I'm just going to tell you. Uh, last Monday, when the price of the barrel of oil went below a dollar. <laughs> And it was going to cost somebody thirty-eight dollars to get them to take a barrel to get you to take a barrel of oil off their off their hands. We we cannot ignore that. And uh, for those of you that understand school finance and the Texas budget, public education represents sixty-three percent of the entire Texas budget. And the Texas budget is funded on sales tax and severance uh, ta uh, taxes that come from oil and gas. Uh, we we will not know the impact to the Texas budget on the oil and gas issue for another six to nine months. Um, we won't know the sales tax impact, but the comptroller has already said we're in a recession as a state, and he is there. I'm a part of a small group that that visits with him, and as it relates to school funding, and this is important for all of us, as it relates to school funding, um, while there's a commitment to continue funding us at the levels I just described. I think we would be foolish. We would all be foolish if we thought the 2021 session, which is going to be little, you know, less than a year from now, um, the, this, this is going to have an impact on the, the state budget. And when the state budget is impacted, uh, it's natural for, tech, for school finance to be impacted because we make up such a huge portion of the state budget. So if they end up having to cut or if they end up having to, uh, to move money around or, or do things that they – typically you otherwise wouldn't do, it's going to have an impact on public ed. And uh, as a taxpayer, it, it, it could have an impact on, on, on tax, the tax rates that districts are, are uh, assessing in order to provide uh, educational services. So uh, I don't mean to get the cart in front of the horse, 
uh, but as I've told the board and as I've told my staff, you need to know that this this the, what's happening right now is going to significantly impact us, not just now, but over the next six, nine months, 12 months, 18 months. And uh, we need to be prepared for that. And for those of us who live in this region, oil and gas kind of drives our, our budgets and our industry, our, our econo economy. And uh, so I'll, I'll be happy to talk about that more as we learn more, but the future of school finance is is uh, is okay right now. It's just going forward is what I'm concerned about. And the last thing I'll talk about is the reentry. You know, people are asking, when are y'all going to open? When are you going to reopen? Uh, I don't know. Uh, we are planning summer school in the same with the same process that we're we're delivering education right now with uh, with technology. Uh, we as a district are in the process of buying five over right at six thousand new devices. Uh, like every other district who's in line to get, you know, Chromebooks and laptops and iPads and you, the, the types of the devices that can that can uphold what we're doing in our with our technology uh, platforms. Uh, we are we are using all of the, the 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 technology we have right now, along with the new ones that we're buying. So our summer school is going to be completely online. And if if as what was mentioned earlier, if after two weeks, we see the numbers staying steady and the governor opens up more. And if that continues through the month of May into early June, uh, there may be an opportunity sometime in July for us to open summer school up for a handful of kids practicing all the social distancing rules. Uh, we're not counting on that, but we're it's in the back of our minds that it, it may not be likely, but it's possible. Uh, so we're looking at that. We're also rebuilding as we speak. We're rebuilding a 2021 school calendar in large part to address what I've mentioned earlier, which are these learning gaps. Um, I'm going to I've talked to the board about it. Uh, we've got a task force working on it. So uh, the school calendar, as it was adopted by the board back in February, may change or I, let me rephrase that. I may recommend a change. The board will decide whether they want to do it or not. Uh, but but it'll be in large part based upon how do we catch these kids up from uh, from what they're losing right now and um, so this may be an opportunity for us to redefine what a school calendar looks like. Every one of us on this call have had a calendar that's open. It starts school sometime in August or September, ends in late May. It's been like that forever. And I have been one, one I'm for one that have been trying to change that. But my goodness, it's as soon as I mention changing it, everybody thinks I'm, I'm disrupting their entire world. Um, but this may be, this is going to probably be one of those times where we have no choice but to adjust uh, to overcome what we're going through right now. So uh, with that, I'll I'll be quiet and uh, Barbara, I'll be happy to answer questions or 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 um, I'll be happy to come back at another date and update this group on on kind of where we are. Any questions for, for HD? HD, uh, I think that this mess that we're in right now has has uh, pointed out a, a lot of flaws in our society, not the least of which uh, kids have to go to school to eat. Yeah, it's, um, th yeah, there, there's, there are some of the, the, the issues that, that, that we're dealing with now that have exposed themselves even greater. One is food, obviously. Um, a second, I want to go back to the, 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 the technology component of this. Um, I'm not arguing that internet connectivity is a, you know, is a, a constitutional right or anything like that. I, I'm not arguing that. What I am arguing, and I have argued with our leaders, is that if you expect, and, and people on this call, if you, if you as a taxpayer, if you as a concerned member of a community, not just a leaf, but if you're a concerned member of a community and you expect your school system uh, to meet certain standards for your for your school's kids. The internet's going to have to be a part of it, and we can't we can't rely on um, we can't rely on individuals who either don't have the capacity or the the ability to um, to provide that for their families or the understanding. Um, we 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 can't blame them for this right now. This is this is something we're going to if we if we expect X out of a school system, we have got to provide Y. We've got to provide the information. In the ways for us to get it. I see a question that says, what are the immediate needs from school districts aside from food? Um, I think the most immediate need right now 
um, and, and it's something I was I, I should have said before I before I ended my comments, but our kids and our families need to hear about they need to hear that this is going to be over at some point, that there's hope. Um, you know, we've got a group of high school kids that many of them were born right after 9-11 and now they're getting ready to graduate high school with this. So they book in their life, you know, from birth to uh, to graduating high school with two pretty significant events in our country's history. And a lot of I, there's a lot of a lot of kids who who are, are just they're socially and emotionally drained and, and as, as there are adults. I don't mean to imply it's only kids, but um, I'm thinking that that we've got we've got kids that I mean, excuse me, we have community members that, if possible, just continuing to talk in a positive tone and continuing to encourage and continuing uh, to instill there's hope and uh, that, yeah, this is a tough time and this is a tough situation and many of these children are um, uh, are watching their parents struggle and watching their parents you know either lose their job or lose wages or be furloughed i mean there's a lot of things going on these kids are witnessing and um and we're as a school system we're doing everything we can do to provide that support i think the community could also help as we um as we uh, as we move forward so it's um um you know, this term has been used way, it's way overused, but it's the truth. And it's kind of, we're all in this together and maybe more, never more, never more so than we're, than right now. One thing I, I see a comment about our rollout to teachers. Let me just say this, um, a huge mistake that, that some people have made that we've, that, that people have learned from, and we didn't, we didn't make this mistake. Fortunately, I've got some really smart people that, that surround me. Uh, but before you just decide you're going to start teaching online, you better train your teachers because we have a lot of teachers that weren't familiar with Zoom or WebEx or Microsoft Teams or you know, the, the one of many uh, communication platforms out there. So we spent an entire week before we rolled it out to kids. We spent an entire week training teachers and and our bet. I'm going to tell you something. We have some teachers in our district that weren't very successful in the classroom who are absolute rock stars now teaching using Zoom Classroom or Google Classroom. And, and we as a district are, gonna, are, are literally resetting how do we identify and how do we recognize quality, effective teaching. And it can't be the same way it's always been about how do you do in front of a group of 20 or 25 kids. There's different ways to demonstrate this. And right now we're, we're, we're seeing that and it's, um, I couldn't be more proud of our staff. Uh, a leaf's very fortunate to have some of the people in our district right now. I agree. I think that this is this is uh, we're never going to go back to whatever was re regarded as normal. <laughs> uh, all of us are going to have to learn new ways of, of doing things. I mean, for example, this having this meeting online. I mean, the A leaf Super Neighborhood's been around since the year two thousand, and. Uh, <laughs> Long had to do a dry run with several of us old folks so that we would know how to do this. So it, it does take some training. It's a different skill set. So everybody's going to have to learn something different. Yeah, uh, I see a question that says, oh, hey, Miss Butler, um, are there any counseling services for parents or students? So, um, yes, and, and if you go to our website, there are uh, there's a link. Matter of fact, it's on the, the home page that I mentioned earlier that I think someone shared the link. Um, there is a, a plethora of of uh, support for parents, for children, for a variety of different uh, situations they may find themselves in. I mean, from parents potentially losing their job and, and, and wrestling with all of that uh, to parents who just quite frankly can't figure out how to teach third grade math. And um there there's there's a, 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 an abundance of, of resources for us to help uh, we fully recognize they're not nearly as effective as some face-to-face -face or some type of uh you know interaction that's more personal uh, and you'll find on this link on this website that there are phone numbers that you can call to talk to people in some cases they may be ALE ISD staff um that it's it's a it's a it's amazing as to how the how the the all of these departments have kind of so quickly stood up support for for kids and for parents and it's a it's a 
it's a uh, it's it's rewarding and it makes me it makes me really feel good about uh, our ability to, to pivot when we need to. I see a comment that says about kids uh, being participating more because of time to complete assignments. Yeah, um, one of the one of the one of the problems with public ed for years is we've we've had a set amount of time, whether it's a school day or a period in the day or, or it's a semester or whatever it is, and we expect kids to all perform at roughly the same pace at the same time and to perform at the same levels. What we're discovering now that we've got not only do we have teachers who are demonstrating they're absolutely outstanding in this environment, but we have kids. Um, the, the students I talk to tell me that they love online learning, but they sure miss the social aspect of school. So I'm not claiming uh, that we're going to move to an online and, you know, be an online district and every kid's going to be learning online. That's that's unrealistic, nor is it in the best interest of kids. But it um, but there is a there is a space for this. There is a there's definitely a space for this. And um, and as the as the person said, uh, I, 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 if I have anything to do with it, there's going to be a, a change in the way we deliver instruction in some cases. Are you talking about year round school? No, not necessarily. Not necessarily. I'm talking about, uh, you know, school may look different now. It may be that a kid comes to school for two or three periods a day to take care of some courses and he or she may have online courses the rest of the day and that we we continue to we continue to get funded for for that child. Um, I mean, we got kids doing home. Heck, we got teachers teaching classes at 1130 at night and midnight. And we have kids doing assignments and turning them in at two in the morning, just like college almost. Um, and that works for a lot of kids. That works for a tremendous number of kids. Um, the, the school year itself, the calendar itself, uh, I am very, very hesitant to use the term year round because that that just that's raises the hair on the back of people's necks sometimes who have experienced that in the wrong way. What I am, what I, Barbara, what I am supportive of is looking at uh, non-traditional calendars for certain student populations or for certain courses or for certain uh, segments of our district uh, in order to maximize a, a calendar year, not just a school year, to maximize the calendar year and 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 also maximize the strengths of our teachers and the strengths of our kids. Um, so so no, not year round school for everyone. I, when I talk about this, I always preface it with with, you know, I'm not talking about year round school for a Leaf ISD. I am talking about some non traditional looking calendars for certain student populations, certain campuses. And, and, and as the board knows, as Ms. Butler knows, we started talking about that before this hit. And we've kind of had to push pause on that while we get get through this. But um, I plan to bring it back up and to continue that conversation at some point in the future, but not district wide. No, ma'am, not district wide. Um, are you planning to change the configuration of classrooms or size for social distancing? Um, short answer is yes. Uh, the longer answer is I'm not 100 percent sure what that's going to look like. Um, so we've gone through a we, we're going through a, a lot of scenarios. Um, let's let's um, let's play this out for a second. Let's let's pretend that we we get into the summer, things are settling down. The governor releases all these restrictions and says, "Okay, schools, you guys can open in August or, or September, but you have to you can't have but fifty percent of your facility occupied." I'm making this up, so don't don't hold me to this. I'm just making this up. If that's the case, then we're obviously going to have to do things that are extremely different. We may have to have Monday, Wednesday, Friday for some kids and Tuesday, Thursday for some like we do it like they do in college. We may have to have in some cases, in extreme cases, you may have to have some students showing up in the morning and some students showing up in the afternoon. There there are there are so many different possibilities to this question and, and, and to how we practically respond to this question that, yeah, we're going to have to somehow reconfigure class sizes. Reconfigure ma reconfigure master schedules about when kids are doing certain classes. Um, but yes, I mean, depending on what's in place at the time related to social distance, distancing and public gatherings, uh, we're trying to prepare as best we can ahead of time to meet as many of those different scenarios as possible, fully knowing that it I couldn't. There's no 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 one can sit here today and tell us what it might be in late July, early August. Um, Question says, where do we stand with the degree you have increased technology? Do our students have iPads to hold on a second? Can you see the rest of that? To work on. Um, 
we, no, I, we are not a one-to-one -one district, meaning we do not have a technology device for every child. Never, we, we never have planned on that for, there's a lot of reasons I can get into that later. Uh, this, this situation has changed that. Uh, we are, we are, um, as I mentioned earlier, we are, we are now, we've just ordered almost 6,000 uh, Chromebooks. And in addition to the, uh, I think we had 21,000 or something like that before this, uh, we are getting them out to, to as many students as who need them as possible. Uh, every day, I will tell you, there is every day there is a um, an increase in the number of students who are gaining access to the internet and who are also gaining access using a device. Uh, we have had over, I'm, I'm estimating this, D. Jones would know better than I would, but we've had companies like Shell Oil and CompuDot and a lot of our business partners who have given us Good Lord, we're probably approaching five or six hundred devices in the last couple of weeks that we are getting out to our children. So uh, our business partners have stepped up in a big way, uh, in large part because of Dee Jones and the relationship she has with all of them. Uh, but in terms of us purchasing, we are we are buying them as fast as we can. But knowing that every district in the country is in line to do the same thing, um, so that's that's kind of the. I don't know if that answers that question, but I no, I, I'd be less than honest if I said that every child has an iPad or a device to work on at home. They do not. We're working as fast as we can to, to, to get them one, as long as they have connectivity. We can give them the device, but if they don't have connectivity, then we're uh, all we did was just give them a device. We are handing out paper packets. As many of you know, uh, we just started our second round of paper packet deliveries, and we and students were turning in their paper packets from the first round this week. So we're in the process of doing that. Uh, is there planning for the fall or winter schedules as, until a vaccine or effective treatment as far as we'll be back? Yes, that we are. We're, we're building a couple of mock calendars next year. One of them, or excuse me, two of them are under the assumption that we're going to have this again in the fall. So um, I can't say much more than that because I don't know much more than that. Plus, I haven't shared this with the board yet. I've given the board our the charges that I've given the task force and I've given them the assumptions that we're working off of. And one of those assumptions is to build calendars that would include um, kids being at home until either a vaccine or if this thing comes back, like a lot of people are predicting it will in the fall. Um, we're we will be more prepared. Yes. There, there's no question. Uh, we'll be more prepared on the technology side. We will also be more prepared on the support side uh, in terms of counseling and, and um, social emotional help. A lot of lessons learned. A lot of lessons. Anyone else have questions? Mr. Chambers, thank you. Uh, I think that was an excellent presentation. And uh, I'm going to open it up now for Anybody from the uh, that's on the call, do you have any announcements that you would like to make to, to uh, the rest of, of the participants? Uh, hey, hey, Connie, uh, I saw that you left a, a uh, message earlier regarding televisits. Would you like to talk more about that? Yeah, sure. Can you guys hear me well? Yes. Yeah. Hi, guys. Uh, my name is Connie Camarillo, and I am, um, I'm with Health Clinic, um, and we are a -Leaf's, um health home. Um, we have three sites and a leaf, um, and I would just like to start off with uh, televisits. Uh, we have been implementing televisits um, for at least um, two months, a month and a half, um, and um, hearing all HD Chambers concerns um, and your concerns about uh, behavioral health, um, um, we are equipped to um, take appointments virtually, um, just depending on each situation. Um, and I will send Barbara the flyer for that um, so she could uh, share it with all of you. Um, and we're also, we also, one of our three sites in, in a Leaf is starting testing for COVID-19. Um, and this is our Hope West location um, that is on Westheimer. And we, I will also share that information with Barbara so she could share it with all of you. Um, and we are here uh, for any questions um, concerning health um, that all of you have. Uh, we're trying to do our best uh, um, to see uh, our regular patients and to also take um, questions from the community. 
um, every patient that gets in Hope Clinic uh, is being screened to, for the protection of our staff and of our patients as well. Um, a couple of questions are being asked and we take um, every single patient's temperature as well. Um, and we have started screening, um, testing, I'm sorry, for um, our staff as well. Um, so yeah, we're, we're here to serve you all. And if you have any questions, um, I'm, I'm here to help. Thanks, Connie. Okay. Veronica, do you, do you have anything for us today? Can you hear me? Yes. Well, basically, you know, we've been trying to update our, our super neighborhood information. And I know Department of Neighborhoods is working on, on some uh, robocalling for the community who ha does not have access to internet. So that should be a, a pilot they're starting soon. So I should have some information to you by the end of the week. Okay, good. Okay, comments from the rest of the group. Did, I know this is different. Um, was this was this acceptable? D don't all talk. Hi, this is a uh, Natalie Hurtado with the International District. Just I wanted to say uh, I did like the format. So congrats, Barbara and whoever else in coordinating this. Um, I did also want to to ask or put an ask out there that. The International District is trying to figure out um, different opportunities in which the district can help out. Um, we're planning on doing, I, would, I don't want to call it an emergency board meeting, but um, something early uh, beginning of May to get something moving forward as far as funding. Um, and we're looking for opportunities where it's a little bit different than having non-perishable items passed out because there are a lot of, you know, I know Councilmember Tiffany Thomas is is working with that and um, and they're, you know, the Houston Food Bank and so forth. So trying to find that other niche that, that might be out there. Um, Delore, or D Jones has been phenomenal in, in tapping us into, um, I guess, families that are in high school that are, you know, missing out on having diapers and formula and so forth. So we're, we're looking to get that moving forward and, and help those families out. But if there are other opportunities that, you know, thinking outside the box that, you know, we're not, that we're overlooking, if you can let me know, shoot me an email, give me a call and let me know. Um, so that way we can figure out whatever the board decides to do as far as the funding, what to do with that funding, um, you know, from that point. So i um, open to any idea uh, as long as it's legal. <laughs> I thought you would appreciate that one, Barbara. Yep. Yep, that's what I tell everybody at the garden. You can grow anything that you want as long as it's legal. So anybody else with comments? This is Jill, Barbara. This works. Good, good. Well, thank you so much for joining us this evening. And um, I, I think that mm -hmm. we'll probably do it this way again in May. Um, we mm -hmm. we may explore WebEx. For the for the next one, uh, we're we're trying out different platforms to or different different applications to to see which one works uh, best for us. But um, thank you everybody for uh, mm -hmm. for for joining us. And mm -hmm. now we can go back to not uh, washing our face mm -hmm. or pulling our hair. So see you next month. Thank you. Thank you everyone. Bye bye. Thank you, Barb, Long, Cheryl.